Good afternoon to everyone, um, not only the Nordics. In the Nordics, we see many people joining us from outside the Nordic chapter. Today, we, we will be listening to uh, a presentation which is very relevant also for our context, we think, because it's about fostering research integrity by promotion of equity, fairness, and diversity. Uh, certainly, principles that are deep to or very close to our hearts, and not only to our hearts, but also to many of you who've joined here. And what we all are aware is that indeed there's a greater need for equity and fairness and also diversity, in not only in research, but also in scholarly publishing. And this is the field where we are working in publishing and uh, editing. So uh, while this is very clear, um, we have come, I think progress has been made and awareness is there, but we're not yet there. So in 2022, there was a conference, the research, World Research Integrity Conference, and for the first time it, it took place in uh, on the African continent. And this, of course, and the theme that was given to the, to the uh, conference, which was um, on uh, research integrity in an unequal world. So ev evidently this led to discussions on the topic. And as far as I understand, I wasn't at the conference, unfortunately, but these discussions have culminated in a group of people coming together and writing what is called the Cape Town Statement. And Lynn Horn, at the time our speaker today, was one of the co-chairs of the conference. And she is a She's currently the director of the Office of Research Integrity at the University of Cape Town. And she's also an assistant professor at the C Center of Applied Ethics at Stellenbosch University. And she's worked in research integrity and ethical questions for over 20 years. She's a trained medical doctor. I understand you also have a long-standing clinical uh, practice where by these uh, topics that we talk about have certainly played a role also in your day-to-day -day life as a medical doctor. And uh, so without further ado, thank you so much for joining us and please take over then. Um, thank you so much for that um, very generous um, introduction. You can all hear me okay? Yes. Um, so, so I'm going to talk about the Cape Town Statement, and um, which was an output of the Seventh World Conference on Research Integrity, and um, even at the conference, there was a lot of there was a lot of interest, you know, in the fact that we were talking about this and that we were bringing the idea of unfairness and inequity in research into a research integrity space. So I think that the big for me, the big shift here was that there have been, you know, there have been various guidelines and documents that are out there. I think that the, the Swiss one was pro probably the first about how to do research collaborations um, and and a lot about the importance of, of fairness in research. But I think this was making it a research integrity issue. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time a little bit later in my presentation just to, to really bring home why I, I feel so strong, why we all felt so strongly that this actually is a research integrity issue, even if it's not kind of, you know, in terms of the more narrow field of research integrity um, that we're all, all um, familiar with. So the, the Cape Town Statement, where it was published via a, an article in Nature, which can be downloaded. I'm, I'm not going to go into the actual what's actually in the statement in any detail, and it's also on the on the web page of the World Conference on Research Integrity Foundation. So you can also go and it has a, there's a poster, um, and you can go and and download that from there as well. And, and and that's just the poster. So the statement was, in fact, 20 statements grouped around um, five different sets of values. But I, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the journey to the Cape Town Statement. Um, and it was really qu quite a personal journey for me, um, and, and then leading to a very collaborative one in terms of the actual statement. Uh, so I have been working um, as an ethicist 
for the last 20 years. And for a, a period of time, I actually worked as part of a large HIV TB research group as an ethicist um, in order to make to help them do their studies um, in, in South Africa and other African countries and to address a lot of the ethical you know, issues that came up. And and as part of that group, I used to travel to Washington um, as part of the HPT, the HIV um, uh, Protection Trial Network meetings. I, I, yeah, I think I got that right. Um, to Washington every year. And I just, I was always just so struck as to how researchers doing HIV research projects all over the world in really um, low and under-resourced settings and how we would all get on airplanes and travel to Washington. And that most of the speakers leading all these different um, funded projects were mostly American and um you know, and 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 as time went by, there were more. Uh, there were things shifted, and so there were more African, African, or you know, other um, from other um, groups and countries that would participate and actively speak. But th that really, um, you know, that did really strike me as as quite significant. And um, I, I was involved in a project that was an EDCTP funded um, research ethics project to to develop a book, and it was a, a to develop a research ethics in Africa book, and it was a collaborative project with Africans. So we brought we all we workshopped um, Af with Africans who participated in writing chapters, all came together. And shared their stories about how you know, about research on their in their countries, and I think we had eleven or twelve countries involved from all over Africa, you know. And some of those stories really made quite an impact um, on me in terms of some of the the issues that that were quite exploitative in in things that that ethics committees were trying to 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 address. Um, I've also been an EDCTP ethics advisor on several North-South collaborative research projects in Africa spanning the last 10 years, and I've actually just taken on a new one because I find this, and again, it's a it's a collaboration which is led by researchers, um, I think, in the Netherlands and and um, in Belgium. And it's it's in fact not health research; it's around food security and and it's um North Afri uh, East and West African countries are all involved. So I'm really now sort of ten years later. I'm really intrigued to see how this is going to pan out over the next um, couple of years and whether these sorts of projects are going to be different to what I have um, observed previously. And then I don't know how many of you are aware, but CORID, which is the Council on Health Research um, and Development, which was based in Geneva, had a research fairness initiative project. And I, in fact, engaged in writing a report for my own institution. And I learned, and it's really, it's an internal, it's like an internal audit of your own practices in terms of equity and fairness in collaborations. And it was just extremely um, enlightening and 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 you know all sorts of things that 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 engaging in that research fairness and project um threw up in terms of of the way you know we deal with collaborators and over the years so these are just some of the the problems that i think i won't read them all out but that have been articulated by low and middle income researchers that local research priority setting is sometimes overlooked um that they can and often remain unsurfaced power imbalances and collaborations. They sometimes express that they see themselves as glorified data collectors. Um, they often have lack of resources or capacity um, to, to manage or analyze big data. And so they are unable to, I'll, I will talk about that a bit later, but analyze some of the data that they are actually, um, that they actually collect. There's issues around open science that we'll go into a little bit later um, and, and so on. And so there are all kinds of, of things that have been articulated to me in often in just informal discussions over the years where I've gone, for example, to a site initiation <coughs> for a clinical trial and had discussions um, with, 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 with um, those that are participating in these studies as investigators. Um, and for the Cape Town statement, it 
I was one of the co-chairs and and I felt it was an opportunity that couldn't be missed, that we were actually having the conference in Africa for the first time and that we needed to really have an output that possibly could make an impact. So we made a proposal to the program committee um, and we had pre-conference Zoom discussion sessions. We developed a pre-conference background paper. And then actually at the conference, we were allocated, which I'm very grateful for, a plenary session to kick off this discussion. And then we had two 90-minute, what they call focus track sessions, but were really sort of think tanks um, and around this whole issue and what were the important things and what values did we want to bring to if we were to develop such a statement. And we used the World Cafe method methodology, which I think I, many of you I'm sure are familiar with. And we had various um, questions that were posed to those um, to those that were participating. And so I think it, it's really just to backtrack a little bit and to say why is inequity and a lack of fairness and diversity in research a research integrity issue? Because there are, I think, people that think that perhaps it isn't, that maybe it's a research ethics issue, but it's not really a research integrity issue. Um, and I, I disagree with that. And I think most of the participants who were involved um, in the statement, you know, were were agreed that this is a research integrity issue. So if we actually look at this through the research life cycle lens, which is what I'm going to do, and, and we look, you know, from research priority agenda setting through to establishing your, te your team and developing a funding proposal, engaging, you know, with stakeholders and communities, collecting and analyzing data, and then, um, disseminating that data and and I think at each almost every one of these points there are there are things to that, that are important to consider so if we start off with research priority and agenda setting so research integrity obviously requires that the most pertinent research questions for any given problem and context are asked and adequately answered but if you are getting research agendas that are primarily getting developed and funded in the global north and grant calls are developed primarily by people in funding agencies in the global north and collaborations and consortia are developed in response to these grant calls and then researchers in the global south are added because the call requires this and this is often the case and i know because i've been added at the last minute to uh, you know to or asked to be added to quite a number of of um of projects that that um su suddenly realize that they need to have a a somebody outside um somebody in the in 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 the global south um as part of the the team so then the, but the problem can be in particular i think in health research that the research agenda setting um can become a flawed process and not all the necessary or the priority research questions get adequately posed and funded and answered. And you can have these power imbalances between teams that lead to neglect of pertinent research questions. And also you can have valuable local community input, including that of peer researchers, which uh, again, I'll come back to, um, can be ignored or, or given very late. And so this is just quoting from our pre-conference background paper where we said some Global South researchers thus run the risk of being add-ons or glorified data collectors or, or access givers to valuable research sites. And yes, they agree because they need access to funding and they hope by getting on the bus, even with terms and conditions, they will be able to advance their careers to a point where they can be PIs in their own right, get funded directly, develop research agendas that directly meet the needs of the communities in which they work. Um, so establishing, if we carry on talking about establishing the research team and this collaboration, obviously, if you have lack of diversity in a research team, um, that can lead to bias in interpretation of data, um, especially when you have issues of race, gender, culture, etc. involved. Um, and collaborations that are a means to an end for a high income researchers can lead to inadequate acknowledgement of the value and the contributions of some team members. So whose voice is actually important and whose voice has been heard? 
Um, then the other problem with late involvement in a collaboration uh, can result in poor allocation of budget and the need for shortcuts that can influence data validity. Um, and a, a dominant perspective of the high income grant holder can sometimes unduly influence research questions, um, methodologies, and analysis. This is an example that I was personally um, involved with as an, as an ethics ad advisor. Um, it was an HIV research clinical trial in two um, very low-income um, African countries, and it was led by researchers from uh, universities in Europe. And at the midpoint of the trial, it became really clear that endpoints were not going to be reached. And the local researchers at that point admitted that they were, they were aware of certain cultural taboos that, that were affecting the study, but they had hoped that this would be an opportunity to quantify that effect. And they didn't seem to have adequately discussed this at the project development stage. Um, there was certainly no social science nested studies that could have explored this in more detail and maybe come up with solutions, even to the point of possibly postponing this clinical trial until some of these things had been sorted out. I, I in fact, had a di direct um, conversation with the PI about this and, you know, and the PI's perspective, which I think is has validity, was that the results and the information gained still made the study very valuable. But it did raise all sorts of questions to me about, you know, could we have done this a bit better and a bit differently um, if there had been more engagement and more community engagement um, at the beginning and more involvement of the of the local people um, in the development of the research questions and possibly identifying some of the, the qualitative research that should have been done in conjunction with this. So the other issue, another issue is around funding. So funding um, requ requirements and processes often fail to recognize that the lack of human and system support and the really arduous due diligence requirements um, and unfavorable currency exchange mechanisms, um, lack of full cost budgeting, et cetera, can put local researchers within a team at a great disadvantage. Um, and, and, and this can lead to the need to, to cut costs and to cut, take shortcuts and, um, and, and, and come across almost as not being able to manage the project. But if I'm a researcher in a, in a country in Angola, for instance, and I am just trying to do a clinical trial with some researchers, um, from elsewhere, and I don't have a financial um, department and a legal contracting department and a project manager and all of that, then it, I'm possibly going to come across as, you know, as not doing a very good job when in fact I actually just lack the support um, at my own, at my institution to in compared with the support that is often at institutions in higher resource settings. So and and this can lead and I I've I've, I've worked as a research integrity officer um, at my previous university and I'm certainly always getting pulled into issues at my current institution and I, and it can lead to questionable research practices. One can't obviously say you know it, it was due to the funding and whatever, but sometimes I just think um, that 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 pressure can and and particularly. Co contracting um, field workers, you know, under very unfavorable circumstances because budgets don't allow better can can just lead to things being done not as well as they should be. So the whole issue of community engagement I've, I've brought up briefly, but it's again, it's, uh, it, you know, the different ways of doing community engagement and, and it can be window dressing, it can be you know, to get visible support for a project. And it's often not substantive or not nearly substantive enough to actually make sure that 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 the community and those stakeholders on the ground are really informing the research right from the beginning. Um, so issues around collecting, analyzing and, and um, storing and sharing data. I think, you know, obviously research integrity requires that data is analyzed, stored, reanalyzed, shared in a manner that's trustworthy, et cetera. Um, and, but if you have inequity and unfairness, this can be, uh, this can undermine that. 
Inadequate support systems can be result in data being stored and protected suboptimally um, with potential for data breaches. Funder often put huge pressure on for early sharing of data, and that can force under-resourced collaborators to have to share data on open plate platforms or via data access committees before they've had an opportunity to actually interrogate the data they've collected themselves and maybe look at secondary analysis or secondary attempt to address you know, local research priorities that may not have been included in the original study. And a better resource researchers from high income countries can are often able to access and use the data far more quickly. Um, another thing, lack of diversity in research teams um, can lead to biases in data analysis and interpretation. I'll say something more about that as well. And um, funder requirements or lead PI requirements may mean that the data is hosted on servers and centers in the global north, and that local collaborators don't find easy it don't find it easy to access for various re reasons. And I attended a global forum on the global world. I think it's the World Health Organization Global Forum by Ethics quite a number of years ago, and and it, this, the conversation was all around this issue and. And one of the papers that pr was presented there, and I, I'm quoting from it, that said, All the, although the majority from the um, Oxford Tropical Medicine Research Unit research data is generated in LMRCs, to date, no request for access to MORU data has been received from institutions and in LMRCs. Instead, applicants tend to be from well-resourced groups in high-income settings who have good IT infrastructure and capacity to conduct complicated statistical analysis and mathematical modeling. So the authorship and publication dissemination, which I, is, I know what we're sort of focusing on here, um, is a big issue. And obviously, and this, there's a, if you look into the literature, there's so much literature to show that this remains a, a big issue and that there's often inadequate credit to LMIC collaborators. Um, and that helicopter research, although we're trying very hard to stop it, it, it carries on. And I can, uh, you know, and I, two examples that I've that I that I have been involved because I've been asked by a, a chair of an ethics committee as to what I think. Um, you know, one was around domestic violence in Kailicha, which is a very a township in Cape Town. Um, a very, it's an almost an informal settlement in places, very um poor poor area. You know, doing research on domestic violence. Um, and researchers and they're working through a a, a NGO. Um, no local researchers involved. Um. And and you know and and then then they're going to go back and publish, um and and what are they going to say? And again, I mean another is another thing that I've been really interested in in the past was fetal alcohol syndrome research and the social justice is issues around that. And this research also mostly been done by by investigators from the U.S. publishing um, and stigmatizing and naming communication, uh, naming communities, um, and conclusions that you know that that may not necessarily be um, be that relevant and can be biased. So open science is an important pillar of research integrity. But I think we all know that there are barriers to open science publications for so many LMIC researchers because of article processing costs. Um, LMIC researchers at institutions that have limited access to many journals and, and publications because of great under-resourcing of their libraries. And, um, and so therefore they publish in, in subscription-based journals um, because, because of the APCs that they can't afford. Um, and then, then their colleagues cannot access their own, their publications in, you know, leading to a, a disruption in, in scholarship. So what does the Cape Town, I'm nearly finishing, um, what does the Cape Town statement say specifically for journal editors? 
Um, first of all, diverse, under the value diversity and inclusivity as a pathway to fair practice and attribution, it says journals and publishers should question the practice of excluding local researchers from low-income and middle-income countries from authorship when the data are from the LMICs, and they should have a low threshold for rejecting such papers. And this remains a huge fight for LMIC researchers. And this is an article published by researchers at my own institution who analyzed um, African COVID articles published in top 10 health, um, health journals um, during the COVID epidemic. And they, they found that that 20%, so that's one in five of publications in top medical journals about COVID in Africa did not have an African author. And 66% of authors in total were not from Africa. So editors need to know which authors have contributed what and who has been left out. Um, so I think that, that, you know, and by using some kind of contributor role taxonomy um, to make, you know, even that might not necessarily always be, the answer, but um, but some some uh, some of my colleagues have called for you know for for authors to have a whole a re reflex a, a reflecting statement about contributions, um, so that so that editors can have deeper insight into actually who contributed to what. Um, under the value fair practice from conception to implementation. So barriers to open science, which I've already mentioned, are is a big issue. And the, the statement says barriers to open science participation by researchers working in low resource settings need to be identified and addressed by publishers and other appropriate national and global stakeholders, such as science councils, funders, and similar institutions. Journals and publishers should adjust page costs for authors from low resourced environments. And I think that there's been a huge amount of good work happening around this um, in, in the last while. But, you know, but there still remain significant problems. And if I can give an example for my own institution, we have a budget for pay what, what we call page costs or article processing costs, which come, amounts to about $160,000 a year. And that covers about 100 to 130 articles in your gold open access journals. So, but as a university, we publish 2,500 academic articles per year. And we don't currently qualify for some of the platforms that widen access because South Africa is not considered um, a low income country. And I had this conversation with our previous um, deputy vice chancellor for research, and she's a chemical engineer working on water security and safety, um, which is so important for colleagues in Africa. And she said, I can only publish one in five papers open access, um, hence relevant African scholarship is often not available to other scholars. So I think these are my last two slides. Research priority um, the under mutual respect as a pathway to trust. Going back to research priority and agenda setting should include all research partners. HIC research agenda should not be imposed on LMIC collaborators. And if that if that principle is not upheld, then what gets submitted for publication may not be what really should have been submitted because the actual pertinent research questions have been bypassed and or they haven't been answered adequately. Um, so and 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 the thing is, if the data is coming from LICs and the lead authors are from HICs, has the data been interpreted with the necessary context and culture and sensitivity been taken into consideration? So the example that I've just given you about um, the, these Northern European researchers working in our local um, township on domestic violence and and again the research fetal alcohol syndrome um, issue. So, and then the final group of values um, in the statement is around indigenous knowledge recognition and and, um, and it's about the whole notion of communities and the value of communities and the value of this of the knowledge that some of these indigenous communities um, can bring. And the idea that actually, you know, even that 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 
people involved in research in these communities can play such a valuable role. And they don't even necessarily need to have formal um, qualifications, but that doesn't mean that they have to be excluded from a, an authorship line just because they actually haven't been to a university. Um, and and this particularly um, in, I just want to put this one up. So in Namibia, the the, the Namibian um, Khoi and San people actually have developed their own code of ethics because they have there have been so many academic papers published over decades, particularly in the field of genetic research, with only HRC authors and, and limited acknowledgement of local um, contributions, literally thousands of, pa of papers. And the SAN Council have said we need researchers to come in through the front door, not the back window. So I think informed editors and publishers can play a vital gatekeeper role, even if only to ask the right questions and expect answers um, that are reasonable and well justified. So that's it from me, and um, I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Lynn. That was a really inspiring talk, and I'm sure we have a lot of questions and comments coming up. So I have one comment already, and that really is a little bit similar to what I saw in the chat. Um, we're talking now a lot from, from the perspective of North and South global divide. Uh, as I mentioned before, when we had a quick chat in Europe, we're seeing something similar, for example, between North, West and South East in some instances. So when you mention that there are not enough avenues for people from less resourced countries where to publish, um, Diamond Open Access came to my mind. There are some journals which are reputable and uh, follow that as a publication model. And then also I was wondering, and I think Iraba had the same idea, can we as editors invite or tell authors to include authors uh, from, so the, the authors from a non, uh, from, from a high income country or a setting which was not the setting where the research took place? Can you involve people or maybe to at least at that stage think about have they involved people who should in theory be authors? Can we be more upfront on that? Over. So I th I mean, I think the answer to that is definitely yes. And without the risk of, you know, of, of bringing people in right at the end. So that's why it's so important that these things are sorted out at the beginning. But if you get something submitted, where the data has been collected in Mozambique and there's not a single, you know, but but the, all the authors are from London or, you know, whatever, London School or I shouldn't really name any universities, but, you know, just any, um, then I, I think you have to ask the question um, is, you know, who are your collaborators and how, and how did they contribute? And, um you know, and 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 see that as some as as a role that you can actually play, um, and not just accept. I know the Lancet has now taken a stand on this, not just you know accept the paper at at face value, because it's only when people start really getting asked these difficult questions that I think practices are going to change. If I may, uh, one problem with that is that you, well, if you confront them, the authors with they, they needed to uh, uh, to uh, to bring in someone who has really done the work, then you risk ending up with uh, someone on the author list that shouldn't be there because oh, exactly they didn't exactly. do the whole thing when the whole thing was written. So that. That's an argument for your uh, your thought, Lynn, about uh, the contributors list instead of the authorship lists. Yes, which I think yes. is really a good yeah. thing. No, sure, and you don't want that to happen. To get, you know, th that's what happens with these funding consortiums that have just about been funded, and then you know, and then it's um, bringing in somebody in. Um, quite late in the day when all the discussions and the research questions and everything have all been set. Um, 
So one doesn't want that to happen. But I think it's just to ask the question, you know, this data has all come from wherever Mozambique, and we notice that there are no authors from Mozambique. Can you, you can you explain that, you know, as a first, you know, as a neutral question, just as a first start? Yeah. And that's an obvious obligation as, a, as an editor, I think, to ask those questions. Yeah, I, I but so. then we have one question in the Q&A. This is from Eleni Flack Davison. She writes, thanks for your presentation. We have had discussions this past three days at the declaration of Helsinki and CIOMS events on what is meant by community as from the research participant to the researcher who come from a number of communities. Do you think that we should look at what is meant by community from a broader perspective? perspective um let me just get rid of that yeah it's such a good question um because that's i think that's where community you know and stakeholder engagement can just be window dressing um and and it can be a, a very superficial look at you know and uh, just just getting a couple of people maybe from a local clinic or whatever to come in and you know and 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 discuss in a one hour meeting discuss a but a whole but a stakeholder engagement plan and um you know can, it needs to be a really well thought out document and should be part of the the initial research proposal i think especially when doing these kinds of you know particularly in health research but in doing research in communities um, to actually identify who all your stakeholders are, how can you access them um, in ways that empower them, that don't just, you know, and 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 I I I think in that slide that which was just one slide, but I, um, on community engagement, I, I I've been lecturing to students for in far more detail about community engagement. You know, it's that whole. It's to do it at a really substantive level, and to and and um, I think some of the research projects that have been done more recently with the sand community have been have been at that sort of level where they've been included on authorship lines and their voices have really been heard but that certainly wasn't the way it was done um you know sort of previously um so yeah community engagement participatory research there are a lot of guidelines on this but it's difficult and it requires it often requires almost a pre-phase in a research project to be, you know, and 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 possibly even to be funded as a pre-phase, that formative research where you go into communities, listen to, to people, do, you know, that sort of social science research that then actually informs the, the the research questions. I mean, this this HIV clinical trial that I spoke about, and I don't want to talk in any detail about it because you know I, I want to keep the, the the identity of the the people involved you know um, confidential, obviously. But but I had just felt that that I, I you know that that I'm not sure what level of community engagement there was, and whether whether people were empowered because. And that can be the value of having sites where you have community sites that are long term that go way over, you know, just one particular research project. So, so although, yeah, you, know, you you know, sometimes you'll say, "Oh, a community is over researched," but the the flip side is that they become they become empowered during that process when an, when they. Are, are when a research site is developed and sustained over a long period of time with with different projects coming in and and my involvement in the past in HIV TB research has has definitely seen that it's not just you know going into a site for one project and then leaving and that's the end of it that can be where your community engagement and your stakeholder engagement um can be done really well and and um and where you are not just consulting, but really listening as well and changing things in order by, by, by what you're hearing. So mm. sorry, I can get a bit um, <laughs> waffly sometimes. No, but, um, you know, very good yeah. point you have there. Uh, but the Cape Town statement is about research, of course. But what about research on the Cape Town statement itself? The Mary Hodge 
Jackson asks, do you have any research on to what extent the 20 recommendations of the Cape Town statement have been implemented? Um, I think that that would be a something great to do, but and hopefully we will be able to do that. All you know, I, I it's still quite new. It was published now, not even a year ago. So I think that to actually be able to get funding and to try and and see what impact, because one never really knows. You know, I've, there's been a lot of interest, and I I know because I've been asked to you know, to do, to speak at a lot of forums and things. So there is interest, but whether it will change behavior and how quickly that will happen, I have no idea. I'm, I'm an optimist, but I, you know, I really don't know. And yeah, it, it would be great mm. to actually have a research um, project that looked at that. Yeah, because changing behavior is not an easy thing. No. No, they say that research progresses uh, one funeral at a time so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and please everyone write your questions in the q and a or in the webinar chat if there are any uh, while we went while we wait for some more questions i have one uh, you have given us you've pointed to a lot of problems and you've given us a lot of answers and probable possible solutions but there's one thing i wondered about you you talked about open access uh and more accurately you talked about open data and the risk of researchers in lm lmic's becoming data miners or what you something like that for researchers in higher income settings is there anything we could do i mean open data is coming now probably at the greatest speed that we and we think, yeah, uh, and this could be a bigger and bigger problem. I think, as you pointed out, yeah. I mean, what I, I do. Think it's, a, it's a double-edged sword, which I think funders, you know, don't always recognize sufficiently. That 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 maybe there should at least be a, an embargo period. You know, and it can be a short embargo period from the end of the study to two years, you know, where the the local investigators have a chance to, you know, to to do whatever secondary analyses and interrogation of that, that data they would like to do. Um, so that to me would be would be one solution. Um but you know, when it's uh, much of this research and health research is publicly funded, I mean, in our country, you know, our research we rely on the NIH from America. The, you, you, you know, my own institution has a huge amount of of NIH funding. I believe the most, you know, outside of of America, and so we do rely, and it's for them, it's public funding, and they want that data to be accessible to as many people who can use it, um, you know, as well as they can. But it is a double-edged sword, I think. And and I, you know, in some of my EDCTP work, where I've become aware that all the data is uploaded to, you know, to servers and to act and about underneath firewalls and access committees that are sitting in in the lead European institution. And I just think you know, will those investigators, those collaborators that are part of the team, they're usually not the lead investigators, sitting in Tanzania or whatever, are they going to ever really access that data or put a proposal? I don't know. And the, and the evidence seems to be, um, you know, that, that they don't. Um, and, yeah, so so i i think a more thought given around data embargoes for at least a period of time um before having to share data you know sort of publicly on um that that might that might be one step hmm. could i challenge you on that lynn sure um this is certainly true for long term research research with a long term effect in any situation, in, in any health threat situation, or in any, would we come back to a situation like the pandemic? 
when it is emerging, we need all these data because people need to look at the data early and they need to share. So in these situations, it's probably that we really need many people taking common efforts, undertaking common efforts to to really educate not only authors, that's too late probably, but as you said early on, funders and and also the researchers themselves. Is there any from the Cape Town Declaration you mentioned, at least at the general level, you mentioned the Lancet has taken action. Could you elaborate a bit further on what journals or some people who may have been involved and who have who are also working in the publishing editorial sphere, have, what have they done in terms of putting the principles on and the ideas into practice uh, for editors, for example? Could you give some examples to that effect? Um, I, I mean, the main one that I'm aware of is the the Lancet making a public statement that they that if the authorship line did not include if the data came from an LMIC and that authorship line did not include those authors that they would have a very high index of rejecting the paper. So that was the one um, public statement. Um, in terms of you know others. Uh, uh, what others other publishers are doing I think really more just around awareness raise, raising for instance I've been asked by Wiley you know to to speak on the topics and to give you know the similar kind of thing to what I've done today so it's really more around awareness raising around the issues but whether other um, authors are, ta you know, whether other e publishers are taking very concrete st steps in this direction, I'm not sure. Um, certainly, there have been, you know, in terms of opening up access, there has been a lot of 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 really good movement around that um, in in the last, you know, couple of years. Um, so, you know, so making open access journals far more accessible. Um, to L to LRC um, people, yeah. I think Mary's put a a, a link in the, the to the Lancet statement on this in the in the chat. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, one more question for you, as an ethicist. Uh, do you think or? Do you have experience that uh, in countries or regions where uh, ethic, ethical review boards are not that um, efficient maybe, or there are not such rules, do you think that has led to or could lead to research being done by researchers from high income countries that they wouldn't have been able to do in their own country? I mean, is this a problem at all? Um, I think it is. I, I don't know if you know about the 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 trust. There's actually the ethics dumping trust case book, which has been published, which has a whole lot of case studies. It's it's open access, so you can just Google it. And of recent research, that's that's been done. Um, where where probably none of this research would be able to have happened in in you know, in, in lo local countries. So I think I think it's, you know, there's been a lot of capacity development. Certainly EDCTP has been huge and the NIH in developing the capacity and the of of um IRBs or, or research ethics committees across low income countries. And they've done, you know, there've been many training programs um, in order to upskill those research. So I'm, I think that this kind of, as we call it, helicopter research is less than what it used to be, but I do think, you know, it's still happening. Um, that there are still people that don't fully understand all the issues or that, you know, if if you're doing if you're if you're investigating a local phenomenon in South Africa, you know, in a like like the example that I gave of domestic violence, but you and and you are living and the entire research team is living in a far north country. Do you really have an understanding of you know of the nuances and the 
the, in order to interpret interpret your data and and write it up with that cultural sensitivity, um, and and so and and if that that research, if the if the ethics committee that approves that research is in the in the northern hemisphere country, and the researchers, which is does happen a lot, bypass. They say that I've we've got ethics approval because we we have received it from our own institution. And it's not, it's, they then bypass ethics approval in the local um, country in Africa, or wherever, it, legally in South Africa, you're not supposed, you you know, it's, it's actually a requirement, but I think it happens all the time, that research will go ahead with understanding, well, we've already got our ethics approval. And I then think as an ethicist, that those people sitting in those IRBs may not have the understanding of some of the issues, even some of the, even some of the the, the language use that goes into informed consent forms and things, you know, that that if if the project had been reviewed by a local ethics committee, um, would have had a different a different take on it. And mm. would have, you know, would have suggest made suggestions to improve things. I mean, I think most ethics committees don't try and block research, but they try and and mitigate risk and and you know and improve communication and that sort of thing. Mm. Indeed. And uh, then Mary has a question from the from the chat. He's, she writes: Are there some issues relating to LMIC researchers being based in high income settings? That is, if they are at universities in high income settings, but will be well in touch with their own low and middle income countries communities issues. I mean, I think that 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 certainly you know that if i've understood the question properly is it in it's not in the chat i just wanted to it's in the chat yes it's a bit it's in the sort chat. Of up from the bottom oh really no i mean i think i think that that those researchers can can act as such a valuable bridge you know to um if, if if they are and often there are fellowships where researchers from a low income country will be doing a you know for a period of time working and then in in a in a um, high income institution and then they can act as a bridge and certainly help you know with with some of the sensitivities around things um, language and consent forms and you know sometimes needing to to access community gatekeepers and how that's done. And um, I've, yeah. I've seen that particularly um, with, with some research done in Ghana, um, you know, where, where the, the, the person was work, currently working at, was working at Oxford at the time and was able to, you know, to navigate that, I think, um, quite well. So, and that's why I think the value of long-term collaborations, you know, that go, uh, over uh, not just one project, but that are developed over a period of time, and even as research sites that get developed and sustained over a long period of time, where the whole idea of of you know of looking at of reciprocal benefit and 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 that in a way is 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 very positive, I think, and can and can help undo a lot of the problems that I've I've just been talking about. Yep. And at the same time, that's a double-edged sword as well. I mean, uh, researchers from low-income countries going to high-income countries and prestigious okay. universities on grants and never returning. Okay. We've seen that within my field of neurology, where yeah. neurological services in parts of Africa are non-existent. But when uh, doctors go out to train in neurology, they just never return and adding to the brain drain. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, what Was there any more questions? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Well, then I think it's up to you, Ines, to close the whole thing. Uh, yeah, I had, uh, so now. again, again, thank you very much, uh, Lynn. Thank you for everyone who has uh, listened and put uh, questions and thoughts in the chat. It's an important topic, and Lynn, you've shown us that 
we have a role as editors to play and we can really raise awareness in our in our respective areas of work for this important topic to close the divide to be more inclusive than we often are and you have shown us also ways how we can reach that possibly um and so with your previous statement i think we we were ending on a positive note that there are ways to doing this and there are ways to collaborate even though it may still take some time i'm i'm sure we're taking small steps to get it going in a good and right direction um we can't give you applause online, of course, but I think there's a virtual applause from more than just me. Thank you so much. And uh, for everyone who's joined the webinar, this is webinar, Nordic webinars will continue. And our next topic will also be on research. It'll be how important and how can we as editors contribute to making science relevant and impactful for policy. So that will be our next webinar. And I see Mary puts all the details in the chat. And I guess we will be in touch, uh, some of us and others, Cora, and also you're always welcome to join our webinars. Thank you for today and a very good rest of the late afternoon and evening. Goodbye. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.